Hi, I'm Aaron Parecki, Senior Security Architect at Okta. This year we launched our first Octane for Developers experience with an agenda full of developer-focused sessions and hands-on workshops. We also held our first Developer Day at Octane, made by developers for developers, with relevant and engaging identity sessions, a dedicated community zone, interactive identity adventure game, and one-on-one -on -one architecture reviews. You could even code your own badge. This webinar is a collection of highlights from our Developer Keynote and Developer Day sessions to bring you the best of our Octane for Developers experience. You'll see past keys and actions, learn how fine-grained authorization is empowering frictionless collaboration, explore digital credentials, and much more. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we are thrilled to have so many new things in this Octane 2023 tailor-made with developers in mind. As developers, you are the innovators who put technology to work. You are crucial and decisive contributors to protecting user identity. You don't just enhance functionality, you build the very foundation of trust with every user. You are the ones turning complex business use cases and ambitious ideas into simple clicks to delight your users. And Okta's mission is to help everyone to safely use any technology. And developers like yourself are at the heart of that vision. Your passion and dedication inspires us. Our commitment remains firm to make sure that your experience is always simpler and faster without sacrificing security. And today we are here to showcase our latest investments and show what is it to come. As you know, the authentication journey starts with user login, which is the first step in securing your application. The login box is the symbol of user authentication. The username and password combo has become synonymous with user identity verification. And it's been what we have been using for last three decades. It is about the time we move past it. In this keynote, we will steer into three pivotal categories. Authentication, which is logging in. Authorization, which is controlling the access for people who logged in. And of course, developer productivity, which is making it easy for you to bring these capabilities to your applications. So we started with in universal login, making it easy to authenticate users with the username and password or using common social identity providers. We made it easy to implement login and sign-up forms with custom data to help you tailor your authentication experience. Now let's take things to the next level with the latest authentication and phishing resistant technology. That's why earlier this year, we announced that we are starting our journey to 100% passwordless future. Yes. Not only do our end users hate the hassle that passwords bring, but they're also most common attack vector for bad actors. According to 2023 data breach investigation report by Verizon, 80 6% of web application breaches involve the use of stolen credentials. Bad actors are adept at using stolen credentials and the personal information they obtain to attack other systems. And over this past year, we observed more than 14% of all login attempts were considered to be credential stuffing attempts. On the day with the highest share of credential stuffing at traffic, we blocked more than 10 million malicious login attempts in one day. To protect your application and our shared customers, we continue to support making security measurements easier. And this week, Passkey support has come out of our lab's environment and is available to everyone. Passkeys can and should replace passwords. They are discoverable and can sync across devices meaning that an application, including your browser, can discover if there's a passkey created for it. So you don't need to get creative, create a new password, clicking on the forgot password link, and of course, change your password only to be told that you can't use the same password. The great thing about passkeys is that credentials are backed up in the cloud and synced to your other devices, enabling you to move between your devices smoothly. But what does this mean for developers? When you switch to passkeys, the transition from passwords will be smooth because they are easy to support along with passwords. It will also increase the developer velocity as you don't have to maintain or debug 
password-dependent systems. We take care of the complexity behind passkeys so you can focus on offering a better user experience. You can now enable your users to use synced passkeys tied to their Apple and Google accounts across multiple devices, providing you seamless experience secured by FIDO phishing-resistant authentication. By removing the need for passwords or shared secrets, attackers cannot intercept them or use stolen credentials. Let's take a look at how authentication with passkeys looks like. And for that, I would like to pass it over to Carla Uria, who's going to give us a demo. Hello, everyone, and thank you, Vavna, for that insightful introduction for passkeys. Now, I want to tell you about this app that I've been building in my spare time, kind of like a side project. I already use Altero at work, so I decided to add a universal login book to this app that I called Carla's Journal, because I'm that creative. At this point, we have a basic login box where I put my email, and I'm also going to put my old and complex password that I just created, which I can't remember, as usual. And I cannot tell you how many times this has happened to me. So when I heard about passkeys, I knew I had to try it right away. Alt Zero made it pretty easy for me. All I have to do is go to the management dashboard, and then in the authentication side, go to my database connection. Then in the new authentication methods tab, I will see that I have both passwords and passkeys. And the cool thing is I can have both enabled. So I'm going to go ahead and enable passkeys just by switching this toggle. Now, when I go back to my app and I log in, I see that I have a new button, Continue with Passkey. And I can use it once I register a new passkey for this account. Because I already registered my account with a password, I have to log in with those credentials first. And that's OK, because it makes the migration easy. And I actually remember the password this time. Once I log in, the page asks me if I want to register a new passkey. And the cool thing about this passkey that I'm registering is that it would only work for this domain. No other domain will be able to use this passkey. This makes my passkey phishing resistant and guarantees that no one will access my journal by stealing my credentials. It doesn't matter how good you replicate Carla's journal. If the website is not that one, the passkey won't work. Now that I have created the passkey, I can use it to authenticate. So here's me, another day of trying to journal, and I click on Login. And now I see that in the username and email field, I can touch it, and I can see that there's already a passkey suggested for me. I can click that, or the Continue with Passkey button. And now this is a very cool thing. Because passkeys are discoverable credentials, the browser knows already if and which passkey I have created for this website. I don't even have to remember if I have an account created or not. The browser prompts me from my Touch ID to access this passkey, which means I'm adding more than one authentication factor in one step. Because I am using something that I have, that's the passkey, and something that I am, and that's my fingerprint. If you remember, earlier talked about seeing passkeys. And in practice, if I want to log in, let's say, from my iPhone, I can totally do it by using face recognition. And the cool thing about the passkey is that you can sync it through a cloud-based keychain like Apple's Cloud, And that would make my passkey available in all of the devices that are connected to that same keychain. It honestly, it feels like magic because all I had to do was to switch a toggle and everything was just working. We believe strongly that passwordless authentication is the future. And that's why we are happy to announce that every customer identity cloud offering, including our free tier, will support passkeys out of the box. We believe that authentication flow should fit your business needs and not the other way. We offer actions as our solution to extend authentication. Ever hit a wall searching for perfect action to fit your unique use case in our marketplace? Well, that's about to change. As we are working on Actions Navigator with Okta AI, Picture this, you just chat with a natural language interface, expressing your needs, and that's all. The AI dives deep, not only finding your match, but if there is none available, also scripting the foundational code of your custom action out of the box. Let's boost your productivity and help you get back to building your core application. 
Let's enter the future of coding together with Actions Navigator. And we have tons to share on the authorization journey too, starting with our FGA product that we previewed last year. And to share more on authorization, I'd like to invite our president of the Customer Identity Cloud, Shivain Ramji. Now let's discuss how you can implement a system where your users, the ones you authenticated, only see and do what they're supposed to. Let's discuss authorization. Privacy decides what can be shared with whom. Compliance says who can access what and under what conditions. And then we all know sharing facilitates collaboration at work and at play. All of these have three things in common. Authorization connects them together. Or they all have high risk if done wrong. And this complexity is likely not core to your business. So authorization is the next challenge for the identity industry. And Okta is here to help you solve the authorization problem much like we did with authentication over the last decade or 15 years. Today, authorization is a focus area for the big platforms. You know, companies like Airbnb, Carta, Google have all built extensive internal systems to implement authorization. But candidly, authorization is not their core business. But you know, they didn't have solutions. They are large platforms and companies. They had to invest in it. That's why we built Okta Fine Grain Authorization. FGA enables you to define your authorization model, and we handle storing and surfacing the data to you when your app needs to make critical authorization decisions. Answering questions like who can do what and what documents can be accessed. OpenFG is a consistent and global authorization system for determining whether users are authorized to access specific resources. And we design OpenFGA for reliability and low latency at very, very high scale. SDKs for OpenFGA currently supports popular programming languages like JavaScript, Go, .NET, Java, and Python. And we're working incredibly hard to bring more SDKs and tools in the future. Okta FGA is built upon OpenFGA, providing what you expect from a managed service. Okta great environment that can store billions of relationships, blazing fast data replication, and all of it backed by Okta, running this massive production critical distributed system at scale. To enable high availability, Okta FGA deploys across multiple regions, preventing service interruption if a region is not available. It also routes your API requests to the closest region to minimize read latency. FGA starts with basic rules that you can use for your application's entitlement management. And as your company and products grow, you can build more complex authorization models, adding granular sharing permissions and collaboration capabilities. The industry is moving fast, and we're always moving with it, trying out new things with up-and-coming standards and technologies. One of the things we see a huge potential in are digital cryptographically verifiable credentials. These are credentials that can be stored on digital devices, and you can use cryptography to verify their data and authorship. It could be maybe an ID card issued by a country or your driver's license to provide your age or address. We believe digital credential is going to be a big thing in the future of digital identity. And there are already standards from W3C for verifiable credentials and from ISO for mobile driver's licenses. Now, the challenge is that these are relatively new and can be complex to understand and implement. This is where we come in. As I mentioned, mobile driver's licenses or MDL are cryptographically verifiable driver's licenses. As of today, there are some states that allow you to store your MDL in your Apple wallet so it can be presented in person. For example, at TSA when you're at the airport. Google is also working to support this as well, which means these credentials will start getting adoption everywhere. This has huge implications. Users will be able to use MDL to simplify know your customer or KYC processes, implement credential recovery mechanisms, and even sign in into applications. And as always, 
true to how we've operated and built our products, we want to make it easy to work with these mobile driver's licenses. Thus, we are working to support online MDL verification, which will be available next year. But that's not all. We are thrilled to unveil our brand new site dedicated to developers to understand this spec, mdl.me. So you can dive deep into the heart of the MDL specification and play with hands-on dynamic examples. With mdl.me, you will learn how mobile driver's licenses are formatted, verified, and how all parties in the ecosystem work together. Now, let's talk about our innovations in scalability so that we can keep up with your business's growth. I'd like to invite Bhavna back on the stage to talk about that. So let's deep dive into developer productivity. This is all about making your work easier, more efficient, and more impactful. So I have a question for you. Name the company that had the fastest user base growth this year. Yes, OpenAI. The one company that grew the fastest and everyone is talking about. As a login provider for OpenAI, this meant we had to meet that growth rate. The high scale capacity required us to apply architectural changes and to tell you the story of this scale journey. Let me invite our chief architect for customer identity, Mark Walker. So, Bhavna, the fun thing about this story is just how fast it happened. When OpenAI introduced ChatGPT, it was a smash hit. They quickly accumulated millions of users. When a customer goes viral, that means we have to go viral with them. So, to accommodate OpenAI's growth, we needed to move fast to upgrade our capacity. So over six months, we upgraded the largest cloud environments to handle over six and a half times the amount of requests per second and raised that limit from 1,500 to 10,000. We've not only managed to improve the scale of the platform that it can handle, but we've also made numerous improvements to make it more resilient and efficient. High scale for us doesn't mean just scale. It means scale, resilience, and efficiency all at once. You don't have to choose. Perfect. And by the way, we're already working on doubling that 10,000 requests per second limit again. Odd Zero always has been built with developers in mind, and we continue that journey with Okta now, whether it's getting you started, help you integrate with our universal login into our application, or provide you with the tools to configure every feature we offer. Our developer experience team is always dedicated to making your life easier and enhancing your experience. This year, we are working on bringing two clouds together so that we can leverage their combined power to create seamless experiences for customer identity cloud SaaS builders and workforce identity cloud enterprises. As a SaaS builder, you want quality exposure of your product to potential clients, and we can help with that by allowing you to quickly make your application available on all Okta works, workforce customers. We are the Okta Integration Network. OIN. The OIN is a catalog of integrations that enterprises use to give their workforce seamless access to the technology they need. Having your application listed here will allow you to reach thousands of potential enterprises. Because you're using customer identity for your SaaS app, as we add capabilities to customer identity cloud, your customers using Okta Workforce Identity Cloud We'll get features like provisioning, governance, and risk signaling without you having to write or maintain a single line of code. I'm really excited about this, as it is something that only Okta is positioned to do. And it showcases the power of our two identity clouds. You might have heard the word passkey once or twice this week. So this session is pretty much an introduction and going a little deeper to understand what a passkey is. It's pretty much three main topics, what, why, and how. We want to talk about passkeys and where they're actually coming from. They are pretty much a brainchild of the FIDO Alliance. Their mission has always been to reduce the world's overlines on passwords. Now, to passkeys. The most important part is that it's a cryptographic credential and it's bound to the verifier. So mainly it's the domain or it's called relying party or relying party ID. And with that, they are phishing resistant. And passkeys themselves, they can be used as a primary authentication method. And that's because the key material as well as the metadata 
are stored on the client side so they can be discovered and the authentication flow doesn't need any data from the server. The main thing that the server can do persist the public key so in the future it can verify the assertions coming from the client. And there's also the attestation itself that has more data about the authenticator and Hans will go more into detail later. And then the authentication flow, very similar, right? And now I have a key for the domain. Again, download a challenge. It's bound to the domain or the RP ID. It gets signed, and then the assertion goes back to the server. And the server can use the public key to validate this is a legitimate authentication. It knows the authenticator. And because of the challenge, it cannot be replayed. We want to now look what kind of authenticator types there are. So there's platform authenticators. They're pretty much integrated in the operating system. You probably already use them. That's, for example, Windows Hello, Apple Touch ID. On the other hand, we have roaming authenticators. Those are um, additional devices that you can carry around and they connect to your device. And very new are passkey providers. Those are pretty much extensions to the um, platform authenticators. So there are discoverable credentials. They were previously called uh, resident keys. And if there's discoverable credentials, there's most likely also non-discoverable credentials. And those are also called non-resident keys or server-bound keys. And that means the key material is actually not stored on the client side or in the authenticator. It's created by the authenticator and encrypted with the key that only the authenticator has, and then sent to the server and stored there. And every time I'm authenticating, I pretty much have to download that encrypted blob first. Now, if you overlay that, how that all fits together, there's discoverable credentials on the left, non-discoverable on the right. And platform authenticators, they are mainly discoverable credentials. Roaming authenticators can be both, but the way they are used today, they are mainly used as non-resident keys. And passkey providers, obviously, today, they're all discoverable. And for us, that means that there's great overlap between discoverable credentials and passkeys. This is how CIC is using it, or the Custom Identity Cloud. Pretty much um, roaming authenticators will also be discoverable credentials. We talked about the why and how great it is and how great the user experience is and the security. I'm going to get into more of the nitty gritty of what do I need to keep in mind when actually adopting this in reality. So kind of the big pieces should be pretty obvious is registration, authentication, and account recovery. Those are your three primary angles uh, for you know, any sort of authenticator experience. And then I'm going to touch in and probably weave throughout the heterogeneity aspect of just you know, the diversity that's in the ecosystem right now. So a couple things that are uh, different when pass keys when uh, registering a new user is that user verification and consent may or may not be there, but that may be important to you for if you're gonna use this as two factors or one factor. So some passkey providers have just a user presence check and not full biometrics, and so that should just be one factor. So you may wanna do a step up depending on your security posture for that. But if it does have user verification, then you know during registration, hey, I can use this as a two factor and you're good to go. The way you do find that out is there's metadata. Do keep in mind that for discoverable credentials, that metadata is stored on the authenticator. So don't put P any PII in there. And then the attestation, this is how you find out the properties of the key. This comes during registration only. <laughs> so do check during registration what the properties of the key are that you just registered so you can know how to use them down the line. Uh, additionally, some providers will give a signed attestation that says who they are. It's called the AA GUID. It's basically, it's a fancy way of saying the universal ID for them with FIDO itself. And you can go look that up on the MDS that FIDO hosts so you can get properties about that provider. Now, less on the technical side, more on the philosophy side. Things that matter during registration that you should keep in mind, especially now as the ecosystem is being built out, order does matter. So if you make a platform bound passkey, you're gonna have a harder time setting up a second device. And so make sure, especially like the desktops, they haven't quite gotten to the syncable fabric stuff yet. So do try to build in like set up two or be aware that you have some sort of path to create a second passkey if it does happen to be device bound for their first passkey. Especially hardware bound passkeys do have a storage limit. And so your more security conscious users who use physical tokens may not want to do a discoverable credential. If you think that's a large part of your user base, do keep that in mind. Maybe you want to build some optionality there. A really important part, the way you get phishing resistance is binding it to the domain that you use to authenticate and registrate on. So your registration authentication should be on the same domain because that is what you're binding it to. And also you cannot change it in the future without having to re-enroll everybody. Like your domain and be confident in your domain when you start rolling out passkeys because that is what you're being bound to. And the reason is that if you start shifting your domain around, that is the same thing as a phishing attack. There is no way for the authenticator to discriminate that. And so that's a function of the phishing resistance. And so it's, it is locking you in there. And then also with revocation, it is different than passwords. Do be aware of this. With the password, you know you have old password, new password, type it again, it's an atomic action. 
With passkeys, that's not the case because the authenticator is involved. The authenticator is actually creating the key that you're using and registering. So make sure to register the new passkey that you're replacing before revoking and getting rid of the old passkey. On to authentication. And this is the cross-device authentication piece. This is actually very helpful, especially for creating you know, a second passkey on a new device or in limited input devices. What this does is that if I have, say, my desktop where I don't have a passkey yet, or it's like one of these hotel uh, computers I just go need to log into real quick to print something, uh, you can use this cross-device authentic authentication flow where it shows a QR code, and then I can take my phone, which already has a passkey, and use the authenticator there to get a session on the other device. So it's very handy for a lot of scenarios, and do try to take advantage of it. The OS and browser handle a lot of that for you. Passkeys are not identity proofing. It is an authenticator token just like a password. People can share passkeys. The same way they do password sharing, a lot of the new sync fabrics that are being built, for instance, the Apple ecosystem, you can airdrop it to another user. So don't consider this bound to a user. It is bound to a user account. So if you have password sharing issues in your product, you're going to have the same issues with passkeys. So you need to solve that separately. And then biometrics aren't always useful. A lot of the passkey providers do have a pin fallback mechanism. But in case it doesn't, do have an escape hatch for your users in some manner. So sync fabric. I've said this word a lot. I have not told you what it is yet. <laughs> so let me get into that real quick. So the sync fabric is new in the past year or so. This is the part that we really think will drive adoption for passkeys because before it was all device bound. And so you'd really had the adoption problems, especially in consumer scenarios where people lose their devices, their backpack takes a swim in a lake. And so you had this hard deal with losing the only thing that can get you into a website. So the sync fabric was created to help solve that problem. So now instead of being hardware bound to a device, the passkey is stored in an encrypted blob in the device, but it's software backed. And it can, that is then backed up to the cloud and then pushed down to new devices. So what's great about this is that you no longer have to solve the new device scenario. The sync fabric solves that for you. So they're in charge of new devices. And so by making it a lot more like a password manager experience, we're really hoping that'll unlock a lot of these scenarios. The last piece that should happen very little, but is the one that gives everybody nightmares and headaches, account recovery. <laughs> Again, like we've been saying, it's no longer just your responsibility to do account recovery. It's not just you have a password hash stored in your database that you have to take care of. It's now a shared responsibility between you and the sync fabric. So new devices, that's the sync fabric's problem. You know, they own that. You may need to guide them to the correct place so they can do that experience, but that is now the sync fabric. What you own is like the total disaster scenarios of like they forget their sync fabric password or something weird happens and they no longer have access for other reasons to their sync fabric or the sync fabric loses the key for some mysterious reason, that's where you step in and do the normal account like email magic link or call the help desk or what have you. And do try to guide your users to the correct sync fabric. The sync fabric owns a new device, but not all sync fabrics go across all ecosystems. We've touched on a bunch of things, but do keep in mind that this is an evolving ecosystem. It's a year old. You know, everybody's building out support. So some pieces are still being standardized, especially around the sync fabric. The browser experiences are in their early stages, but they are iterating extremely rapidly and making it better and better every day. Something that we as Okta or the FIDO Alliance cannot do ourselves is educate the users. We need your help with that. That's going to be a global problem. Everybody's going to have to do this together. So users don't know what passkeys are. They may have heard it a few times in the news, but you're really gonna have to educate them and bring them along with you to this better world. We've gone over a lot. I just wanted a last little summary slide of kind of all the things we've talked about here. The real key, I think, on this slide is that far left column, phishing resistant. That's the one thing passwords don't have that this does. And that's the thing that all of these different types and all these different scenarios we've gone over of passkeys do have. That's the big win here. I know I've gone over a lot and there's even more complexity. So this website I found very useful to keep an eye on, passkeys.dev slash device support. But also, what if you don't have to worry about all this complexity? You know, Okta can do this for you. So if you want to get this into your CIC tenant, it's really, really easy. And all you have to do is change to an identifier first flow, because you don't need that password anymore. Go over to your authentication method settings and turn on the toggle. That's all it takes, and now you have passkeys. I'm Aaron Parecki, uh, Senior Security Architect at Okta. I also uh, work on a lot of the standards, uh, OAuth and OpenID Connect and SCIM. We are going to talk about the difference between how enterprise companies expect to deal with identity problems and how that's different from how consumers expect to deal with identity. We'll talk about how single sign-on works and get into a little bit of the details on OpenID Connect. You are probably familiar with a typical login box with a username and password. And this can get you pretty far when you're building a SaaS app. You may also then quickly realize that you need to support 
other social identity providers in order to be able to reduce the friction of onboarding or just getting users to come back into your application. Maybe you've even added support for passkeys into your application. What's interesting, though, is that these all have something in common. The user's account is their own account, and they're all like isolated bubbles from each other. From your app's point of view, you just have a bunch of users. This can take your SaaS app pretty far as you're growing and scaling your business. You may then realize that actually what people want is to be able to have team accounts. So let's say you go and add team support into your application, but as we're quickly growing and, and adding more and more of these kinds of features, we're getting closer and closer to what it looks like to be a fully enterprise-ready application. Let's say that there's that one user of your app who now loves your app so much that they actually want to get their whole company on it. In fact, their IT department wants to you know, do a site license, and their IT department says, oh, well, we are not going to let those users log in with their own password to your application. We're not even going to let them have their own Google account or social login. Instead, all the users are going to sign in through the enterprise company's SSO provider. And there's a lot of benefits to this from the enterprise customer's perspective. There's one place to manage credentials. There's one place to manage multi-factor auth. If they want to require that all employees have multi-factor of a certain type, they can do it in their SSO portal. There's one place to manage who has access to which applications. And very importantly, it gives them a single place to revoke access when needed. In order for your application that you're building to support enterprise customers like these, you need to support doing a single sign-on flow to their identity provider. So from your perspective, each enterprise customer is going to be a completely different identity provider. And it's kind of like if each enterprise customer was a different social connection like Facebook or Google. So the good news is that it's not as complicated because there are open standards for this. So you can write the code once and then configure it to different identity providers. Instead of logging into your application with a password, they're going to enter just their email address. And when they enter their email address, your application can discover which identity provider they should be using to log in and send them on their way over there. So from your perspective as a SaaS developer, you're going to be seeing the world like this, where you have your app, that's the center of your world, and you're connecting out to a bunch of different identity providers. From the enterprise perspective, they see their identity provider as the center of their universe. And they're going to see that as where they manage everything and how they're able to let applications connect to the enterprise. And they're going to be picking and choosing the best of the SaaS apps that they would like to use and putting them all together under the enterprise IDP. OpenID Connect is actually built on top of the OAuth framework. OpenID Connect is not about getting access to data, it's about signing in. The main thing that you're gonna be dealing with in OpenID Connect is called an ID token. So the ID token is how the, the server encodes data about who just logged in and what happened, any attributes about them. And the tricky part about this, which trips up a lot of people, is that so ID tokens are defined in the spec as a JSON web token, as a JOT. That is, OpenID Connect. So in OAuth, access tokens don't have to be JOTs, but they often are. And there are good reasons to do them, to use JOTs as access tokens. However, even though these two tokens might be JOTs, they are not the same thing and you cannot mix them up. You can't use them interchangeably. I like to think of an OAuth access token as a key. When you get a key and you go open a door, like you don't really care what are the little jaggy things on the key mean. You don't, you don't need to know that. You just need to know that you can put it in the door and turn the key and the door opens up. Now, OpenID Connect, on the other hand, that ID token is something you are expected to read when you're building an application that's going to be receiving an ID token. It's like a receipt where it says, the OAuth server says, this user logged into this application on this date with a password or with MFA and things like that. So the audience of the ID token will be the client that got the token. The audience of the access token is going to be the API where you're going to be getting data from. Let's walk through what it will look like to actually start building in an OpenID Connect flow into a SaaS app. You're going to take out your password field. You're going to put just an email address. They're going to type in an email, and if it matches email domain of a customer, you're going to look up the identity provider for that customer that you've got in your own little database of configuration and send them off to that customer's IDP to log in. Let's say they entered a company email address, 
you did the SSO flow using OpenID Connect, you got back to your app, and now you know who they are because you are able to read the ID token. You're going to then need to have some concept of that user in your own app's database. So you'll put a record in your database, like user ID one came from tenant number one, and their external user ID was this. And then if users from a different company log in, you might have user ID four came from tenant ID two with this user ID, all in your local database. So actually there is a claim in the ID token called subject, which is a stable unique identifier for that user at that identity provider. So this is probably closer to what your database will actually look like. The actual flow at a high level is you're building this application, this client, and this flow, it turns out, is gonna be the same whether you're building a mobile app, a single page app, a web server based app. Start with the client and have your login button and then redirect the browser to the OAuth server that'll send the user's browser over to the authorization server where they're gonna log in there. So that's where the user sees their password prompt. They don't see a password prompt in your app. Once they log in, it's going to send this authorization code back into the browser, which brings it back to your application. You can then go make a request directly from your client application to the authorization server, exchanging that authorization code for the ID tokens. So what the user sees is a prompt, they enter their email address, You'll decide what to do with them, like redirect them to their enterprise ident identity provider. You're not gonna see what happens here, which is the entire point. They're gonna log in with their own company password, their own multi-factor auth, and eventually they get sent back to your application where you can do that code exchange and you're logged in. The step-by-step -step of the OpenID Connect flow, if we just look at the URLs and the data moving around, the first thing that happens is your application builds a URL like this to the OAuth server. This is where they're going to see their login form at their enterprise IDP. Then they're going to do whatever sequence of events their IDP says they need to do to, to prove who they are. And that server will then create a redirect back to your application. And in that redirect will be this long string called the authorization code, which that's what you can use to get the ID token. So you're gonna get this in a redirect, which means you're reading it out of the address bar. You take that, you make a post request back to the OAuth server, exchanging that authorization code for the tokens. And this is the same in OAuth and OpenID Connect if you're doing the flow this way. The nice thing is that you can actually get both tokens at the same time. And notice that they both kind of start with the same few letters because they're both JSON web tokens. So you grab this ID token from this post response that you just got, and now you're ready to actually figure out what does this mean. So a couple of interesting things here. Again, subject at the top, that is the unique identifier for that user at the identity provider. This identity provider is identified by the claim issuer, ISS, which is that one. And that is the identifier of the OAuth or OpenID server. So that pair is what you can use to be like, oh, is this the same user that I've seen before? And then the rest of these claims are the either profile or login information. So we've got like user's name and email are in there, timestamps of when the token was issued, when it expires. Uh, AMR is telling me how the user authenticated. So this is actually a really important one. If you know that your application has requirements that you need all the users to have a second factor, you can actually put that in the request to the OAuth server and then they will get prompted for a second factor and then you can confirm it by looking at the AMR claims here. Auth time, I think this is an Okta specific one, but that's the timestamp the user last entered a password in case that's relevant to you. And these are the kinds of differences that you might see depending on the particular OpenID Connect server you're talking to. Is that sometimes these claims, they have like their own custom claims in here. But that's how you can grab the user's info. I want you to meet Alice. Alice is tech savvy and what the kids call extremely online. Alice has accounts on just about every platform you can think of, from social media to streaming services, and she utilizes her trusty email address as a universal identifier. Unfortunately, one day Alice loses access to her email. Oh no, right? All of her two-factor authentications and app verifications are tied to that email address. So now, every app and service that collectively form her online identity is now suddenly out of reach. 
And despite being the rightful owner, Alice cannot retrieve her content without access to that email. This unfortunate incident, it highlights the vulnerability of the current web and our inability to own our identity and control our data. But wasn't the web meant to be decentralized? Indeed, it was. However, it's missing a key element that enables it, an identity layer. So applications that require user accounts have to collect our information in order to persist it with our content. What if we could own our identity and our data across the web? This is possible with Web 5. So Web 5 embraces the convenience of the account model of Web 2, but it restores control back to the users and ethos of Web 3. And this platform enables developers to build decentralized applications while abstracting away the complexity of doing so. So Web 5 is comprised of three core pillars, all of which are based on open web standards. We have decentralized identifiers, also known as DIDs or DIDs, verifiable credentials, and decentralized web nodes. So the identifiers that we know and use today are controlled by some intermediary. For example, my email address is an identifier that's associated with me, but I don't own that email address. My provider does. My Twitter handle, also an identifier that's associated with me. I've built a following and created a brand around this lovely handle right there. But what we've seen with the rebrand of Twitter, did y'all see the stories where some of the handles were basically repossessed? Someone had the cool handle X. How cool is that? Snatch right from them. Someone had at music. 16 years they built a brand around that handle and overnight it was taken from them because it was never theirs to begin with. So before we can realize truly decentralized applications, we first need decentralized identifiers. Decentralized identifiers are the only parts of Web5 that optionally touch a blockchain. It can be used on any blockchain or no blockchain at all. For example, this first one is an identifier that is anchored on the Bitcoin blockchain. The second one is anchored on Ethereum. And the last one doesn't use blockchain, it uses the web. Now, because that string is anchored somewhere and it's standing by itself, it works as a URI that points to more information about the DID subject. That information is stored in what's called a DID document. And that document lives in some decentralized storage system, such as IPFS. The document itself is a JSON file, and it describes how to engage with the DID subject. The next pillar of Web5 is verifiable credentials, and they work hand in hand with decentralized identifiers to enable trustless interactions, meaning two parties don't need to know or trust one another in order to engage. I have an example. Let's say Alice is applying for a loan, but the lender needs to verify a proof of income. So Alice's employer, Acme, will issue a verifiable credential to Alice, which she then keeps with her. She can store this in something like a digital wallet, for example. And let's double click inside of that credential to see what's there. So we have the issuer, who is Acme, and then we have the subject, who is Alice, more specifically, we have their decentralized identifiers here, right? And then we have claims that the issuer is making about the subject. So ACME is saying, hey, the person who has the decentralized identifier did example Alice. Her real name is Alice Smith, and her salary is $120,000. And then ACME has cryptographically signed 
this verifiable credential. So Alice keeps that in her little digital wallet. And then when the lender asks her for proof of income, she can present this verifiable credential to them. She cryptographically signs it as well. And now the lender can continue on with the loan application. Now remember, this lender doesn't know or trust Alice, doesn't have to. It considers ACME a trustworthy entity. They know that it's ACME, that decentralized identifier was there, cryptographically signed. Therefore, ACME has extended trust to Alice. The last pillar of Web5 is the centralized web nodes. So today, centralized entities act as our data stores. All of our content, our preferences, are stored in these apps, servers. The centralized web nodes changes this by enabling us to decouple our data from the applications that we use and instead host our data with us. Blue Sky is a good example, but instead of things like your connections and your tweets being stored with the app, it's stored with you in your own personal data store. What this means is if decentralized Instagram or decentralized TikTok pop up, I can take my connections, I can take my data and all of this and go to those apps with it intact. Now, decentralized web nodes is capable of hosting both public data as well as private data. So in the case of something like a blue sky, you will want stuff like your connections and your tweets to be public. And then things like your DMs, you want to be private. Now the web nodes are also not hosted on a blockchain. They're hosted with you. Now, while this does offer a paradigm shift in the way that we exchange information, it's not a total overhaul of the web that we already know works kind of like a progressive web app, where if you had a decentralized web app, you would add a Web5 SDK in the flow, and then the app is free to truly go serverless because it doesn't have to host that data itself. Now remember the did document, and we said that did document has things like the public keys and the authentication and verification methods. It also has another section in there for service endpoints, meaning, how do I communicate with this did subject? Where does their data live? And in that part of the did document would be URIs to a did subject decentralized web nodes. So given an application has my did, I authenticated with my did, it's able to resolve that did, see the did document, it sees where my web nodes are, it can send HTTP requests to those web nodes for information. This snippet is a query that is asking for all of the objects in the web node that follow a social media posting schema. So the data that's in the web node follows some semantic type and that's what makes it interoperable across applications. Now, of course, all of this is pretty complicated, especially for non-technical users. So as I often remind builders in the space, decentralization is not a feature that your users are requesting, right? It should be an implementation detail. So we are also building an identity wallet that will allow users to manage this in a really user-friendly way where they can manage multiple identifiers. So Web5 enables developers to build decentralized web apps, and it sits on top of this Web5 stack. These three yellow things, again, are open web standards, meaning they don't belong to any one company. Given this, it's all open source, you're free to use it, but you don't have to worry about the implementation details of making your app decentralized, that's taken care of. You can focus your attention on what you truly care about, which is your app. So let's say that Alice uses Spotify and she wants to try out Tidal with Web5. How this will work is instead of Spotify writing her playlist to their app servers, they will write that to her decentralized web node. Then when she wants to try out Tidal, she gives them read access and they can read all of those music playlist objects 
that have been written to her web note, no matter which app it came from. Medical records. You see Alice, she has a primary care physician. She has a gynecologist. She has a dentist. Now, when she moves, you don't want to call these doctor's offices and plead with them to fax the information over to this other one and pray that they actually do it. She's given each of her doctors read and write access to the patient's records in her decentralized web node so they can write those records there. Now, remember, they're all using decentralized identifiers, so any of these doctors can see who has written that record and be able to verify that, yes, that is a reputable source. I want to show you Web5.js, which is a library that we've developed. It is in tech previews. Because it's a JavaScript library, npm install works just fine. Then I'm just going to import Web5 from Web5 API. Given that, when I'm ready to connect, so a user has come to my application, what I'm going to do is call web5.connect. And this connect function is going to look on the user's device to determine, do they already have a decentralized web node that's local to this device and a decentralized identifier? And what this is going to return is, let's say const, going to return us an instance of Web5 so that we can do further actions. And it's also going to return us the decentralized identifier for this user. Now let's say we want to start writing to this user's decentralized web node. The objects in there are called records. So we can say create a record. And we'll say const record equals await. And we're going to use that Web5 instance. From there, notice here, I have an agent that's like the wallet. So I have the did thing, so then I can start doing things with the did, like resolving it. And then there's DWN, that's for the web nodes, and BC for the verifiable credentials. So we're going to say DWN records dot create. When I create a record, I need to pass in two things. One is the actual payload. And then the other property here is a message. So this is where I put metadata about that payload. I can put, by default, the data that is written to the web node is private. So if I wanted this to be a public record, I would publish it. So I can say publish equals true. And that makes that data publicly available. And then this is writing to this user's web node. But let's say this is an application that's facilitating communication between multiple people. So I would say recipient and then put another did here. There's multiple things you can do there, but that will create a record. It will write that to the decentralized web node. Then let's say I want to query for some records. To do that, I would say const records. Then I'm going to use web5 DWN again, and we'll say records.query. And from here, I can specify what sort of message I want. And I can give it a filter. And then I can specify the type of data I'm trying to read from that record. And then last thing is delete. How would I delete based on this? Await record dot delete. This is Web5 in action. As you can see, we've kind of abstracted away a lot of those details. It's not hard to use. You don't have to think about cryptographic keys, how to do all of this stuff. All of that is done in the background. When I've written and updated and deleted these records, it'll happen on their local web node, but then sync is done in the background on an interval. So it'll resolve their did, look at all of their remote web nodes and make sure that all of that stuff is synced up together on a schedule. That is Web5 in a nutshell. Like I said, it's all open source, so you're welcome to use it. Don't publish your web app just yet until I tell you that it's ready to go, it's production ready. You can play around with it. You can also contribute to it and help us make the web that we all deserve, one where we own our identity and control our data. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us for our first Best of Octane for Developers webinar. To dig deeper into enterprise integration, FGA, passkeys, and much more, head on over to developerday.com and watch full sessions from throughout the event. I hope to see you there next year. Happy coding.